Antony and Cleopatra by William Haynes Lytle From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Antony and Cleopatra I am dying, Egypt, dying! From Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, Act 4, Scene 13 I am dying, Egypt, dying! Ebbs the crimson life tide fast, and the dark Plutonian shadows gather on the evening blast. Let thine arms, O queen, enfold me, hush thy sobs and bow thine ear. Listen to the great heart secrets, thou and thou alone must hear. Though my scarred and veteran legions bear their eagles high no more, and my wrecked and scattered galleys strew dark Actium's fatal shore, though no glittering guards surround me, prompt to do their master's will i must perish like a roman die the great triumvir still let not caesar's servile minions mock the lion thus laid low it was no foeman's arm that felled him it was his own that struck the blow his who pillowed on thy bosom turned aside from glory's ray his who drunk with thy caresses madly threw a world away should the base plebeian rabble dare assail my name at rome where my noble spouse octavia weeps within her widowed home seek her say the gods bear witness altars augurs circling wings that her blood with mine commingled yet shall mount the throne of kings as for thee star-eyed egyptian glorious sorceress of the nile light the path to stygian horrors with the splendours of thy smile Give the Caesar crowns and arches, let his brow the laurel twine. I can scorn the Senate's triumphs, triumphing in love like thine. I am dying, Egypt, dying. Hark, the insulting foemen's cry. They are coming, quick, my falcon, let me front them ere I die. Ah, no more amid the battle shall my heart exulting swell. Isis and Osiris guard thee, Cleopatra. Rome. Farewell. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Habeas Corpus by Helen Hunt Jackson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3 Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Habeas Corpus Her Last Poem 7th of August, 1885 My body, eh? Friend Death, how now? Why all this tedious pomp of writ? Thou hast reclaimed it sure and slow For half a century, bit by bit. In faith, thou knowest more today Than I do, where it can be found. This shriveled lump of suffering clay To which I now am chained and bound Has not of kith or kin a trace To the good body once I bore. Look at this shrunken, ghastly face. Didst ever see that face before? Ah, well, friend Death, good friend thou art. Thy only fault, thy lagging gait, mistaken pity in thy heart for timorous ones that bid thee wait. Do quickly all thou hast to do, nor I nor mine will hindrance make. I shall be free when thou art through. I grudge thee naught that thou must take. Stay, I have lied. I grudge thee one. Yes, two I grudge thee at this last. Two members which have faithful done my will and bidding in the past. I grudge thee this right hand of mine. I grudge thee this quick-beating heart. They never gave me coward sign, nor played me once a traitor's part. I see now why in olden days men in barbaric love or hate nailed enemies' hands at wild crossways shrined leaders hearts in costly state the symbol sign and instrument of each soul's purpose passion strife of fires in which are poured and spent they're all of love they're all of life o feeble mighty human hand o fragile dauntless human heart the universe holds nothing planned with such sublime transcendent art yes death I own I grudge thee mine, poor little hand, so feeble now, its wrinkled palm, its altered line, its veins so pallid and so slow. 
unfinished here ah well friend death good friend thou art i shall be free when thou art through take all there is take hand and heart there must be somewhere work to do end of poem this recording is in the public domain farewell life by thomas hood from the world's best poetry volume three sorrow and consolation part two read for librivox dot org by gabi farewell life written during sickness april eighteen forty five farewell life my senses swim and the world is growing dim thronging shadows cloud the light like the advent of the night colder 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 still upward steals a vapor chill strong the earthly odor grows i smell the mold above the rose welcome life the spirit strives strength returns and hope revives cloudy fears and shapes forlorn fly like shadows at the morn o'er the earth there comes a bloom sunny light for sullen gloom warm perfume for vapor cold i smell the rose above the mold End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For Annie by Edgar Allan Poe. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3. Sorrow and Constellation, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. For Annie. Thank heaven the crisis, the danger is past, and the lingering illness is over at last, and the fever called living is conquered at last. Sadly I know I am shorn of my strength, and no muscle I move as I lie at full length, but no matter, I feel I am better at length. And I rest so composedly now in my bed, that any beholder might fancy me dead, might start at beholding me, thinking me dead the moaning and groaning the sighing and sobbing are quieted now with that horrible throbbing at heart ah that horrible horrible throbbing the sickness the nausea the pitiless pain have ceased with the fever that maddened my brain with the fever called living that burned in my brain and oh of all tortures that torture the worst has abated the terrible torture of thirst for the naphthaline river of passion accursed i have drunk of a water that quenches all thirst of a water that flows with a lullaby sound from a spring but a very few feet underground from a cavern not very far down underground and ah let it never be foolishly said that my room it is gloomy and narrow my bed for man never slept in a different bed and to sleep you must slumber in just such a bed my tantalized spirit here blandly reposes forgetting or never regretting its roses its old agitations of myrtles and roses for now while so quietly lying it fancies a holier odour about it of pansies a rosemary odour commingled with pansies with rue and the beautiful puritan pansies and so it lies happily bathing in many a dream of the truth and the beauty of annie drowned in a bath of the tresses of annie she tenderly kissed me she fondly caressed and then i fell gently to sleep on her breast deeply to sleep from the heaven of her breast when the light was extinguished she covered me warm and she prayed to the angels to keep me from harm to the queen of the angels to shield me from harm and i lie so composedly now in my bed knowing her love that you fancy me dead and i rest so contentedly now in my bed with her love at my breast 
that you fancy me dead, that you shudder to look at me, thinking me dead. But my heart it is brighter than all of the many stars in the sky, for it sparkles with Annie, it glows with the light of the love of my Annie, with the thought of the light of the eyes of my Annie. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Saletta, Saletta, Cry of the Ten Thousand, by Joseph Brown Lee Brown, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Three, Sorrow and Consolation, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Saletta, Saletta, Cry of the Ten Thousand. I stand upon the summit of my life, behind the camp, the court, the field, the grove, the battle and the burden, vast afar beyond these weary ways. Behold, the sea, the sea overswept by clouds and winds and wings, by thoughts and wishes manifold, whose breath is freshness and whose mighty pulse is peace. Palt on no question of the horizon dim, cut loose the bark, such voyage itself is rest, majestic motion, unimpeded scope, a widening heaven, a current without care, eternity, deliverance, promise, course, Time tired souls salute thee from the shore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sleep by Elizabeth Barrett Browning From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian The Sleep he giveth his beloved sleep. Psalm 127, 2 Of all the thoughts of God that are born inward unto souls afar, among the psalmist's music deep, now tell me if that any is for gift or grace surpassing this, he giveth his beloved sleep. What would we give to our beloved, the hero's heart, to be unmoved, the poet's star-tuned harp to sweep, the patriot's voice to teach and rouse, the monarch's crown to light the brows, he giveth his beloved sleep. What do we give to our beloved? A little faith, all undisproved, a little dust to overweep, and bitter memories to make the whole earth blessed for our sake. He giveth his beloved sleep. Sleep soft, beloved, we sometimes say, but have no tune to charm away sad dreams that through the eyeless creep. But never doleful dreams again shall break the happy slumber when he giveth his beloved sleep. O earth, so full of dreary noise, O men with wailing in your voice, O delved gold, the wailers heap, O strife, O curse, that over you fall. God strikes a silence through you all, he giveth his beloved sleep. His dews drop mutely on the hill, his clouds above it saileth still. Though on a slope men sow and reap more softly than a dew is shed, or cloud is floated overhead, he giveth his beloved sleep. For me, my heart, the earth to go, most like a tired child at a show, that see through tears the murmurs leap, would now its wearied vision close, would childlike on his love repose, who giveth his beloved sleep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Prospers by Robert Browning from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Gabi. Prospers Fear death, to feel the fog in my throat, the mist in my face, when the snows begin and the blasts denote, I am nearing the place. The power of the night, the press of the storm, the post of the foe. Where he stands, the arch fear in a visible form. 
yet the strong man must go for the journey is done and the summit attained and the barriers fall though a battle's to fight ere the guerdon be gain the reward of it all i was ever a fighter so one fight more the best and the last i would hate that death bandaged my eyes and forbore and bade me creep past no let me taste the whole of it fair like my peers the heroes of old bear the brunt in a minute pay glad life's arrears of pain darkness and cold for sudden the worst turns the best to the brave the black minutes at end and the elements rage the fiend voices that rave shall dwindle shall blend shall change shall become first a peace out of pain then a light then thy breast o thou soul of my soul i shall clasp thee again and with god be the rest end of poem this recording is in the public domain I Would Not Live Away by William Augustus Mucklenburg From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Liam I Would Not Live Away I would not live away, live away below Oh no, I'll not linger when bidden to go The days of our pilgrimage, granted us here Are enough for life's woes, full enough for its cheer would I shrink from the path which the prophets of God, apostles, and martyrs so joyfully trod? Like a spirit unblessed, over the earth would I roam, while brethren and friends are all hastening home. I would not live away, I ask not to stay, where storm after storm rises dark over the way. Where seeking for rest, we but hover around, like the patriarch's bird, and no resting is found, where hope when she paints a gay bow in the air leaves its brilliance to fade in the night of despair and joy's fleeting angel never sheds a glad ray save the gleam of the plumage that bears him away i would not live away thus fettered by sin temptation without and corruption within in a moment of strength if i sever the chain scarce the victory is mine ere i am captive again even the rapture of pardon is mingled with fears and the cup of thanksgiving with penitent tears the festival trump calls for jubilant songs but my spirit her own misery prolongs i would not live away no welcome the tomb since jesus hath lain there i dread not his gloom were he deigned to sleep i too bow my head all peaceful to slumber on that hallowed bed then the glorious daybreak to follow that night the orient gleam of the angels of light with their clarion call for the sleepers to rise and chant forth their matins away to the skies who who would live away away from his god away from yon heaven that blissful abode where the rivers of pleasure flow over the bright plains and a noontide of glory eternally reigns where the saints of all ages in harmony meet their saviour and brethren transported to greet while the songs of salvation exultingly row and the smile of the lord is the feast of the soul that heavenly music what is it i hear the notes of the harpers ring sweet in my ear and see soft unfolding those portals of gold the king all arrayed in his beauty behold oh give me oh give me the winds of a dove to adore him be near him enwrapped with his love i but wait for the summons i list for the word alleluia amen evermore with the lord end of poem this recording is in a public domain Farewell by Walter Savage Landor 
from the world's best poetry volume three sorrow and consolation part two read for LibriVox.org by lian farewell i strove with none for none was worth my strife nature i loved and next to nature art i warmed both hands before the fire of life it sinks and i am ready to depart end of poem this recording is in a public domain love and death by margaretta way deland from the world's best poetry volume three sorrow and consolation part two read for librivox dot org by sonia love and death alas that men must see love before death else they content might be with their short breath i glad when the pale sun showed restless day was done and endless rest begun glad when with strong cool hand death clasped their own and with a strange command hushed every moan glad to have finished pain and labour wrought in vain blurred by sin's deepening stain but love's insistent voice bids self to flee live that i may rejoice live on for me so for love's cruel mind men fear this rest to find nor no great death is kind end of poem this recording is in the public domain to death from the german of gluck from the world's best poetry volume three sorrow and consolation part two read for librivox dot org by gabby to death methinks it were no pain to die on such an eve when such a sky o'er canopies the west to gaze my fill on yon calm deep and like an infant fall asleep on earth my mother's breast there's peace and welcome in yon sea of endless blue tranquillity these clouds are living things i trace their veins of liquid gold i see them solemnly unfold their soft and fleecy wings these be the angels that convey as weary children of a day life's tedious nothing o'er when neither passions come nor woes to vex the genius of repose on death's majestic shore no darkness there divides the sway with startling dawn and dazzling day but gloriously serene are the interminable plains one fixed eternal sunset reigns o'er the wide silent scene i cannot doff all human fear i know thy greeting is severe to this poor shell of clay yet come o death thy freezing kiss emancipates thy rest is bliss i would i were away end of poem this recording is in the public domain asleep asleep by lucy a bennett from the world's best poetry volume three sorrow and consolation part two read for librivox dot org by lian asleep asleep and so saying he fell asleep martyrdom of saint stephen asleep asleep men talk of sleep when all adown the silent deep the shades of night are stealing where like a curtain soft and vast the darkness over all is cast and sombre stillness comes at last to the mute heart appealing asleep asleep when soft and low the patient watchers come and go their loving vigil keeping when from the dear eyes fades the light when pales the flush so strangely bright and the glass spirit takes its flight we speak of death as sleeping 
Or when, as dies the orb of day, The aged Christian sinks away, And the lone mourner weepeth, When thus the pilgrim goes to rest, With meek hands folded on his breast, And his last sigh of a prayer confessed, We say of such, he sleepeth, but when amidst a shower of stones and mingled curses shrieks and groans the death chill slowly creepeth when falls at length the dying head and streams the life-blood dark and red a thousand voices cry he is dead but who shall say he sleepeth he fell asleep a pen divine hath writ that epitaph of thine and though the days are hoary yet beautiful thy rest appears unsullied by the lapse of years and still we read with thankful tears the tale of grace and glory asleep asleep though not for thee the touch of loving lips might be in sadly sweet leave taking though not for thee the last caress the look of untold tenderness the love that dying hours can press from hearts with silence breaking End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rest by Mary Woolsey Howland From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Gabi Rest I lay me down to sleep with little care, Whether my waking find me here or there. A bowing, burdened head that only asks to rest, Unquestioning upon a loving breast. My good right hand forgets its cunning now, to march the weary march I know not how. I am not eager, bold, nor strong, all that is past. I am ready not to do, at last, at last. My half-day's work is done, and this is all my part. I give a patient God my patient heart and grasp his banner still, though all the blue be dim. These stripes, as well as stars, lead after him. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In Harbor by Paul Hamilton Hayne From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3 Sorrow and Consolation Part Two Read for LibriVox dot org by Thomas Peter In Harbor I think it is over, over, I think it is over at last. Voices of foeman and lover, the sweet and the bitter, have passed. Life, like a tempest of ocean, hath outblown its ultimate blast. There's but a faint sobbing seaward while the calm of the tide deepens leeward and behold like the welcoming quiver of heart pulses throbbed through the river those lights in the harbour at last the heavenly harbour at last i feel it is over over for the winds and the waters surcease ah few were the days of the rover that smiled in the beauty of peace and distant and dim was the omen that hinted redress or release from the ravage of life and its riot what marvel i yearn for the quiet which abides in the harbour at last for the lights with their welcoming quiver that throb through the sanctified river which girdle the harbour at last this heavenly harbour at last I know it is over, over, I know it is over at last. Down sail, the sheathed anchor uncover, for the stress of the voyage has passed. Life, like a tempest of ocean, hath outbreathed its ultimate blast. There is but a faint sobbing seaward, while the calm of the tide deepens leeward, and behold, like the welcoming quiver of heart pulses throbbed through the river those lights in the harbour at last,
the heavenly harbour at last. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hush by Julia C. R. Dorr From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3 Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Hush! O oh, hush thee, earth! Fold thou thy weary palms. The sunset glory fadeth in the west. The purple splendor leaves the mountain's crest. Grey twilight comes as one who beareth arms, darkness and silence, and delicious calms. Take thou the gift, O earth, on night's soft breast, lay thy tired head, and sink to dreamless rest, lulled by the music of her evening psalms. Cool darkness, silence, and the holy stars, long shadows when the pale moon soars on high, one far lone night bird singing from the hill, and utter rest from day's discordant jars. O soul of mine, when the long night draws nigh, Will such deep peace thine inmost being fill? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Life by Anna Letitia Barbold From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Life Animula Vagula Blandula. Life, I know not what thou art, but know that thou and I must part, and when or how or where we met, I own to me the secret yet, but this I know when thou art fled, wherever they lay these limbs, this head, no clod so valueless shall be, as all that then remains of me, or whither, whither dost thou fly, where bend unseen thy trapless cords, and in a strange divorce, Ah, tell where I must seek this compound eye. To the vast ocean of imperial flame, from whence thy essence came, dost thou thy flight pursue when freed from matter's base uncumbering weed? Or dost thou, hid from sight, wait like some spellbound night through blank oblivious years the appointed hour to break thy trance and reassume thy power? Yet canst thou without thought or feeling be oh say what are thou when no more thou art thee life we've been long together through pleasant and through cloudy weather tis hard to part when friends are dear perhaps to cost a sigh a tear then steal away give little warning choose thy own time say not good night but in some brighter clime bid me good morning End of poem. This recording is in a public domain. The Angel of Patience by John Greenleaf Whittier From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Liam The Angel of Patience A free paraphrase of the German to weary hearts, to mourning homes, God's meekest angel gently comes. No power has he to banish pain, or give us back our lost again. And yet in tenderest love our dear, and heavenly father sends him here. There's quiet in that angel's glance, there's rest in his still countenance. He mocks no grief with idle cheer, nor wounds with words the mourner's ear. But ills and woes he may not cure, he kindly trains us to endure. Angel of patience, sent to calm our feverish brows with cooling palm, to lay the storms of hope and fear, and reconcile life's smile and tear, the throbs of wounded pride to still, and make her own our father's will. O thou who mournest on thy way, with longings for the close of day, he walks with thee, that angel kind, and gently whispers, be resigned, bear up, bear on, the end shall tell, the dear Lord ordereth all things well. End of poem. This recording is in a public domain.
They're All Gone by Henry Vaughan From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian They're All Gone They're all gone into the world of light And I alone sit lingering here Their very memory is fair and bright And my sad thoughts doth clear it glows and glitters in my cloudy breast like stars upon some gloomy grove or those faint beams in which this hill is dressed after the sun's remove i see them walking in the air of glory whose light doth trample on my days my days which are at best but dull and hoary mere glimmering and decays o oh, holy hope and high humility high as the heavens above these are your walks, and you have showed them me to kindle my cold love. Dear, beauteous death, the jewel of the just, shining nowhere but in the dark. What miseries do lie beyond thy dust? Could man outlook that mark? He that hath found some fledged bird's nest may know, at first sight, if the bird be flown. But what fair dale or grove he sings he now, that is to him unknown. And yet, as angels in some brighter dreams, call to the soul when man doth sleep, so some strange thoughts transcend our wonted themes, and into glory peep. If a star were confined into a tomb, her captive flames must needs burn there. But when the hand that locked her up gives room, she'll shine through all the sphere, O Father of eternal life, and all created glories under thee. Resume thy spirit from this world of thrall into true liberty. Either disperse these mists which blot and fill my perspective still as they pass, or else remove me hence unto that hill where I shall need no glass. End of poem. This recording is in a public domain. The Bottom Drawer by Emilia Edith Barr from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Three: Sorrow and Consolation, Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Bottom Drawer. In the best chamber of the house, shut up in dim, uncertain light, there stood an antique chest of drawers of foreign wood with brasses bright. One day, a woman, frail and grey, stepped totteringly across the floor. Let in, said she, the day of light. Then Jean unlocked the bottom drawer. The girl, in all her youth's loveliness, knelt down with eager, curious face. Perchance she dreamt of Indian silks, of jewels, and of rare old lace. But when the summer sunshine fell upon the treasures hoarded there, the tears rushed to her tender eyes. Her heart was solemn as a prayer. Dear Grandmamma, she softly sighed, lifting a withered rose and palm. But on the elder face was naught but sweet content and peaceful calm. Leaning upon her staff, she gazed upon a baby's half-worn shoe, a little frock of finest lawn, a hat with tiny bows of blue. A ball made fifty years ago, a little glove, a tasseled cap, a half-done long division sum, some school books fastened with a strap. She touched them all with trembling lips. How much, she said, the heart can bear. Ah, Jean, I thought that I should die the day that first I laid them there. But now it seems so good to know that through these weary, troubled years their hearts have been untouched by grief, their eyes have been unstained by tears. Dear Jean, we see with clearer sight when earthly love is almost o'er. Those children wait me in the skies for whom I locked that sacred drawer. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Over the River by Nancy Woodbury Priest From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Gabby Over the River over the river they beckon to me, Loved ones who've crossed to the farther side. 
the gleam of their snowy robes I see, but their voices are lost in the dashing tide. There's one with ringlets of sunny gold, and eyes the reflection of heaven's own blue. He crossed in the twilight gray and cold, and the pale mist hid him from mortal view. We saw not the angels who met him there, the gates of the city we could not see. Over the river, over the river, my brother stands waiting to welcome me. Over the river the boatman pale carried another, the household pet. Her brown curls waved in the gentle gale. Darling Minnie, I see her yet. She crossed on her bosom her dimpled hands and fearlessly entered the phantom bark. We felt it glide from the silver sands, and all our sunshine grew strangely dark. We know she is safe on the farther side, where all the ransomed and angels be. Over the river, the mystic river, my childhood's idol is waiting for me. For none returns from those quiet shores, who cross with the boatman cold and pale. We hear the dip of the golden oars, and catch a gleam of the snowy sail. And lo, they have passed from our yearning hearts, they crossed the stream and are gone for aye. We may not sunder the veil apart, that hides from our vision the gates of day. We only know that their barks no more may sail with us o'er life's stormy sea. Yet somewhere, I know, on the unseen shore, they watch and beckon and wait for me. And I sit and think when the sunset's gold is flushing river and hill and shore, I shall one day stand by the water cold, And list for the sound of the boatman's oar. I shall watch for a gleam of the flapping sail, I shall hear the boat as it gains the strand, I shall pass from sight with the boatman pale, To the better shore of the spirit land. I shall know the loved who have gone before, and joyfully sweet will the meeting be, when over the river, the peaceful river, the angel of death shall carry me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Grief for the Dead by Anonymous from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org, by Lian. Grief for the Dead O oh, hearts that never cease to year, O oh, brimming tears that never are dried, The dead, though they depart, return as though they had not died. The living are the only dead, the dead live, never more to die, And often, when we mourn them fled, they never were so nigh. And though they lie beneath the waves, or sleep within the churchyard dim, Ah, through how many different graves God's children go to him! Yet every grave gives up its dead, ere it is overgrown with grass, Then why should hopeless tears be shed, or need we cry, alas? Or why would memory, veiled with gloom, and like a sorry mourner craped, Sit weeping over an empty tomb, whose captives have escaped? Tis but a mound, and will be mossed, whenever the summer grass appears. The loved, though wept, are never lost, we only lose our tears. Nay, hope may whisper with the dead, by bending forward where they are, but memory, with a backward tread, communes with them afar. The joys we lose are but forecast, and we shall find them all once more. We look behind us for the past, but lo, tis all before. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Two Waitings by John White Chadwick from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Gabby. The Two Waitings. 1. Dear hearts, you were waiting a year ago for the glory to be revealed. You were wondering deeply, with bated breath, what treasure the days concealed. Oh, would it be this, or would it be that? Would it be girl or boy? Would it look like father or mother most? And what should you do for joy? And then, one day, when the time was full, and the spring was coming fast, the tender grace of a life outbloomed, and you saw your baby at last. Was it or not what you had dreamed? It was, and yet it was not. But, oh, it was better a thousand times than ever you wished or thought. 2. And now, dear hearts, you are waiting again, while the spring is coming fast. For the baby that was a future dream is now a dream of the past. A dream of sunshine and all that's sweet, of all that is pure and bright. Of eyes that were blue as the sky by day and as clear as the stars by night. You are waiting again for the fullness of time and the glory to be revealed. You are wondering deeply with aching hearts what treasure is now concealed. Oh, will she be this or will she be that? And what will there be in her face that will tell you sure that she is your own when you meet in the heavenly place? As it was before, it will be again. Fashion your dream as you will. When the veil is rent and the glory is seen, it will more than your hope fulfill. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For Charlie's Sake by John Williamson Palmer From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3 Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter For Charlie's Sake The night is late, the house is still, The angels of the hour fulfill their tender ministries, And move from couch to couch in cares of love. They drop into thy dreams, sweet wife, the happiest smile of Charlie's life, and lay on baby's lips a kiss, fresh from his angel brother's bliss, and, as they pass, they seem to make a strange dim hymn, for Charlie's sake. My listening heart takes up the strain, and gives it to the night again, fitted with words of lowly praise, and patience learned of mournful days, and memories of the dead child's ways. His will be done, his will be done, who gave and took away my son, in the far land to shine and sing before the beautiful, the king, who every day does Christmas make, all starred and belled for Charlie's sake. For Charlie's sake I will arise, I will anoint me where he lies, and change my raiment, and go in to the Lord's house, and leave my sin without, and seat me at his board. Eat, and be glad, and praise the Lord. For wherefore should I fast and weep, And sullen moods of mourning keep? I cannot bring him back, Nor he, for any calling, come to me. The bond the angel death did sign, God sealed, for Charlie's sake and mine. I am very poor, This slender stone marks all the narrow field I own. 
Yet, patient husbandman, I till with faith and prayers that precious hill, so it with penitential pains, and hopeful wait the latter rains, content if, after all, the spot yield barely one forget-me-not. Whether or figs or thistle make, my crop content for Charlie's sake. I have no houses builded well, only that little lonesome cell where never romping playmates come, nor bashful sweethearts, cunning dumb, an April burst of girls and boys, their rainbowed cloud of glooms and joys, born with their songs, gone with their toys, nor ever is its stillness stirred by purr of cat or chirp of bird, or mother's twilight legend told of horner's pie or tiddler's gold, or fairy hobbling to the door, red-cloaked and weird, banned and poor, to bless the good child's gracious eyes, the good child's wistful charities, and crippled changelings hunch to make, dance on his crutch for good child's sake. How is it with the child? Tis well. Nor would I any miracle might stir my sleeper's tranquil trance, or plague his painless countenance. I would not any seer might place his staff on my immortal's face, or lip to lip and eye to eye, charm back his pale mortality. No, Shunamite, I would not break God's stillness. Let them weep who wake. For Charlie's sake my lot is blessed. No comfort like his mother's breast, no praise like hers, no charm expressed in fairest forms hath half her zest. For Charlie's sake this bird's caressed That death left lonely in the nest. For Charlie's sake my heart is dressed As for its birthday, in its best. For Charlie's sake we leave the rest To him who gave, and who did take, And saved us twice for Charlie's sake. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Watching for Papa by Anonymous From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3 Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Watching for Papa She always stood upon the steps just by the cottage door Waiting to kiss me when I came each night home from the store Her eyes are like two glorious stars Dancing in heaven's own blue Papa, she'd call like a wee bird, I'd sleep tonight for you. Alas, how sadly do our lives change as we onward roam, for now no birdie voice calls out to bid me welcome home, no little hand stretched out for me, no blue eyes dancing bright, no baby face peeps from the door when I come home at night. And yet there is comfort in the thought that when life's toil is o'er, And passing through the sable flood I gain the brighter shore, My little angel at the gate, with eyes divinely blue, Will call with birdie voice, Papa, I is late and out for you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Child by John Pierpont From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Gabby My Child I cannot make him dead His fair sunshiny head Is ever bounding round my study chair Yet when my eyes, now dim with tears, I turn to him, the vision vanishes, he is not there. I walk my parlor floor, and through the open door, I hear a footfall on the chamber stair. I'm stepping toward the hall, to give the boy a call. And then bethink me that he is not there. 
I thread the crowded street, a satcheled lad I meet, with the same beaming eyes and colored hair, and, as he's running by, follow him with my eye, scarcely believing that he is not there. I know his face is hid under the coffin lid, closed are his eyes, cold is his forehead fair, my hand that marble felt, o'er it in prayer I knelt, yet my heart whispers that he is not there. I cannot make him dead when passing by the bed, so long watched over with parental care, my spirit and my eye seek him inquiringly, before the thought comes that he is not there. When at the cool gray break of day from sleep I wake, with my first breathing of the morning air, my soul goes up with joy to him who gave my boy, then comes the sad thought that he is not there. When at the day's calm close, before we seek repose, I'm with his mother, offering up our prayer. Whatever I may be saying, I am in spirit praying, for our boy's spirit, though he is not there. Not there, where, then, is he? The form I used to see was but the raiment that he used to wear. The grave that now doth press upon that cast-off dress is but his wardrobe locked. He is not there. He lives in all the past. He lives, nor to the last of seeing him again will I despair. In dreams I see him now, and on his angel brow I see it written, Thou shalt see me there. Yes, we all live to God, Father, thy chastening rod, so help us, thine afflicted ones to bear that in the spirit land meeting at thy right hand twill be our heaven to find that he is there end of poem this recording is in the public domain song by richard le gallienne from the world's best poetry volume three sorrow and consolation part two read for librivox dot org by gabi song she's somewhere in the sunlight strong her tears are in the falling rain she calls me in the wind's soft song and with the flowers she comes again. Yon bird is but her messenger, The moon is but her silver car. Yea, sun and moon are sent by her, And every wistful waiting star. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Reaper and the Flowers by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian The Reaper and the Flowers There is a reaper whose name is Death, And with a sickle keen he reaps the bearded grain at a breath, And the flowers that grow between. Shall I have not that despair, saith he, Have not but the bearded grain? Though the breath of these flowers is sweet to me, I will give them all back again. 
he gazed at the flowers with tearful eyes he kissed their drooping leaves it was for the lord of paradise he bound them in his sheaves my lord has need of these flowers gay the reaper said and smiled dear tokens of the earth are they where he was once a child they shall all bloom in fields of light transplanted by my care and saints upon their garments white these sacred blossoms wear and the mother gave in tears and pain the flowers she most did love she knew she should find them all again in the fields of light above oh not in cruelty not in wrath the reaper came that day twas an angel visited the green earth and took the flowers away End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Only a Year by Harriet Beecher Stowe From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Only a Year One year ago, a ringing voice, a clear blue eye and clustering curls of sunny hair too fair to die only a year no voice no smile no glance of eye no clustering curls of golden hair fair but to die one year ago what loves what schemes far into life what joyous hopes what high resolves what generous strife the silent picture on the wall the burial stone of all that beauty life and joy remain alone one year one year, one little year, and so much gone. And yet the even flow of life moves calmly on. The grave grows green, the flowers bloom fair. Above that head, no sorrow in tint of leaf or spray says he is dead. No pause or hush of merry birds that sing above tells us how coldly sleeps below the form we love. Where hast thou been this year, beloved? What hast thou seen? What visions fair, what glorious life? Where hast thou been? The veil, the veil, so thin, so strong, Twixt us and thee, the mystic veil, When shall it fall, that we may see? Not dead, not sleeping, not even gone, But present still, and waiting for the coming hour Of God's sweet will, Lord of the living and the dead, Our Saviour dear, we lay in silence at thy feet the sad sad year end of poem this recording is in a public domain blessed are they that mourn by william cullen bryant from the world's best poetry volume three sorrow and consolation part two read for librivox org by lian blessed are they that mourn O oh, deem not they are blessed alone, Whose lives a peaceful tenor keep. The power who pities man has shown A blessing for the eyes that weep. The light of smiles shall fill again The lids that overflow with tears, And weary hours of woe and pain Are promises of happier years. There is a day of sunny rest For every dark and troubled night, And grief may bide an evening guest, But joy shall come with early light. And thou, who o'er thy friend's low bier Dost shed the bitter drops like rain, Hope that a brighter, happier sphere Will give him to thy arms again. Nor let the good man's trust depart, Though life is common gifts deny, Though with a pierced and bleeding heart, And spurned of man, he goes to die. For God hath marked each soaring day, And numbered every secret tear, And heaven's long age of bliss shall pay, For all his children suffer here. End of poem. This recording is in a public domain. De Profundis by Elizabeth Barrett Browning From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3 Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter De Profundis The face which, duly as the sun, Rose up for me with life begun, To mark all bright hours of the day With daily love, is dimmed away, And yet my days go on, go on. The tongue which, like a stream, could run Smooth music from the roughest stone, And every morning with good day, 
make each day good is hushed away and yet my days go on go on the heart which like a staff was one for mine to lean and rest upon the strongest on the longest day with steadfast love is caught away and yet my days go on go on the world goes whispering to its own this anguish pierces to the bone and tender friends go sighing round what love can ever cure this wound my days go on my days go on the past rolls forward on the sun and makes all night o oh, dreams begun not to be ended ended bliss and life that will not end in this my days go on my days go on breath freezes on my lips to moan as one alone once not alone i sit to knock at nature's door heart bare heart hungry very poor whose desolated days go on i knock and cry undone undone is there no help no comfort none no gleaning in the wide wheat plains where others drive their loaded wains my vacant days go on go on this nature though the snows be down thinks kindly of the bird of june the little red hip on the tree is ripe for such what is for me whose days so winterly go on no bird am i to sing in june and dare not ask an equal boon good nests and berries red are natures to give away to better creatures and yet my days go on go on i ask less kindness to be done only to loose these pilgrim shoon too early worn and grimed with sweet cool deathly touch to these tired feet till days go out which now go on only to lift the turf unmown from off the earth where it has grown some cubit space and say behold creep in poor heart beneath that fold forgetting how the days go on a voice reproves me thereupon more sweet than nature's when the drone of bees is sweetest and more deep than when the rivers o'erleap the shuddering pines and thunder on god's voice not nature's night and noon he sits upon the great white throne and listens for the creature's praise what babble we of days and days the day spring he whose days go on he reigns above he reigns alone systems burn out and leave his throne fair mists of seraphs melt and fall around him changeless amid all ancient of days whose days go on he reigns below he reigns alone and having life and love forgone beneath the crown of sovereign thorns he reigns the jealous god who mourns or rules with him while days go on by anguish which made pale the sun i hear him charge his saints that none among the creatures anywhere blaspheme against him with despair however darkly days go on take from my head the thorn wreath brown no mortal grief deserves that crown o supreme love chief misery the sharp regalia are for thee whose days eternally go on for us whatever is undergone thou knowest willst what is done grief may be joy misunderstood only the good discerns the good i trust thee while my days go on whatever's lost it first was won we will not struggle nor impugn perhaps a cup was broken here that heaven's new wine might show more clear i praise thee while my days go on i praise thee while my days go on i love thee while my days go on through dark and dearth through fire and frost with emptied arms and treasure lost i thank thee while my days go on and having in thy life depth thrown being and suffering which are one as a child drops some pebble small down some deep well and hears it fall smiling so i thy days go on end of poem this recording is in the public domain Blessed Are They by Rossiter Worthington Raymond From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2, 
Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Blessed are they. To us across the ages born comes the deep word the Master said. Blessed are they that mourn, they shall be comforted. Strange mystery. It is better than to weep and yearn and vainly call till peace is won from pain than not to grieve at all. Yea, truly, though joy's note be sweet, life does not thrill to joy alone. The harp is incomplete that has no deeper tone. Unclouded sunshine over much falls vainly on the barren plain, but fruitful is the touch of sunshine after rain. Who only scans the heavens by day, their story but half reads and mars. Let him learn how to say the night is full of stars. We seek to know thee more and more, dear Lord, and count our sorrows blessed, since sorrow is the door whereby thou enterest. Nor can our hearts so closely come to thine in any other place, as where, with anguish dumb, we faint in thine embrace. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lines to the memory of Annie, who died at Milan, June 6, 1860, by Harriet Beecher Stowe, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. Lines to the memory of Annie, who died at Milan, June 6, 1860. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him. John twenty fifteen. In the fair gardens of celestial peace walketh a gardener in meekness clad. Fair are the flowers that wreathe his dewy locks, and his mysterious eyes are sweet and sad. Fair are the silent foldings of his robes, falling with saintly calmness to his feet and when he walks, each floweret to his will with living pulse of sweet accord does beat. Every green leaf thrills to its tender heart in the mild summer radiance of his eye. No fear of storm or cold or bitter frost shadows the flowerets when their sun is nigh. And all our pleasant haunts of earthly love are nurseries to those gardens of the air, and his far-darting eye with starry beam watching the growing of his treasures there. We call them ours, overswept with selfish tears, overwatched with restless longings night and day, forgetful of the high mysterious right he holds to bear our cherished plants away. But when some sunny spot in those bright fields needs the fair presence of an added flower, down sweeps a starry angel in the night. At morn the rose has vanished from our bower. Where stood our tree, our flower, there is a grave, blank, silent, vacant, but in worlds above, like a new star outblossomed in the skies, the angels hail an added flower of love. Dear friend, no more upon that lonely mound, strewed with the red and yellow autumn leaf, drop thou the tear, but raise the fainting eye, beyond the autumn mists of earthly grief. Thy garden rosebud bore within its breast those mysteries of colour, warm and bright, that the bleak climate of this lower sphere could never waken into form and light. Yes, the sweet gardener hath borne her hands, nor must thou ask to take her thence away. Thou shalt behold her, in some coming hour, full-blossomed in his fields of cloudless day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Death in Youth by Philip James Bailey From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Death in Youth from Festus For to die young is youth's divinest gift To pass from one world fresh into another Ere change hath lost the charm of soft regret and feel the immortal impulse from within which makes the coming life cry always on and follow it while strong is heaven's last mercy there is a firefly in the south 
but shines when on the wing. So is with mind, when once we rest, we darken. On, saith God to the soul, as unto the earth forever, a rejoicing native of the infinite, as is a bird of air, an orb of heaven. End of poem. This recording is in a public domain. In Memoriam F.A.S. by Robert Louis Stevenson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3 Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter In Memoriam F.A.S. Yet, O oh, stricken heart, remember, oh, remember How of human days he lived the better part april came to bloom and never dim december breathed its killing chills upon the head or heart doomed to know not winter only spring a being trod the flowery april blithely for a while took his fill of music joy of thought and seeing came and stayed and went nor ever ceased to smile came and stayed and went and now when all is finished you alone have crossed the melancholy stream yours the pang but his oh his the undiminished undecaying gladness undeparted dream all that life contains of torture toil and treason shame dishonour death to him were but a name here a boy he dwelt through all the singing season and ere the day of sorrow departed as he came. Dafos, eighteen eighty one. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tears by Elizabeth Barrett Browning from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Three, Sorrow and Consolation, Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Gabby. Tears. Thank God, bless God, all ye who suffer not. More grief than ye can weep for, that is well. That is light grieving, lighter none befell, since Adam forfeited the primal lot. Tears, what are tears? The babe weeps in its cot, the mother singing at her marriage bell, the bride weeps, and before the oracle of high faint hills, the poet has forgot such moisture on his cheeks. Thank God for grace, ye who weep only. If, as some have done, ye grope tear-blinded in a desert place, and touch but tombs, look up, those tears will run, soon in long rivers down the lifted face, and leave the vision clear for stars and sun. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Resignation by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Resignation There is no flock, however washed and tended, but one dead lamb is there. There is no fireside, howsoever defended, but has one vacant chair. The air is full of farewells to the dying and mournings for the dead. The heart of Rachel for children crying will not be comforted. Let us be patient, these severe afflictions, not from the ground arise, but oftentimes celestial benedictions assume this dark disguise. We see but dimly through the mists and vapours, amid these earthly damps, what seem to us but sad funeral tapers may be heaven's distant lambs. There is no death, what seems so is transition. This life of mortal breath is but a suburb of the life Elysian, whose portal we call death. 
she is not dead, the child of our affection, But gone unto that school, where she no longer needs our poor protection, And Christ himself doth rule, in that great cloister stillness and seclusion, By guardian angels led, safe from temptation, safe from sin's pollution, She lives whom we call dead. Day after day we think what she is doing in those bright realms of air. Year after year, her tender steps pursuing, behold her grown more fair. Thus we walk with her and keep unbroken the bond which nature gives, thinking that our remembrance, though unspoken, may reach her where she lives. Not as a child shall we again behold her, for when with raptures wild in our embraces we again enfold her, she will not be a child, but a fair maiden in her father's mansion, clothed with celestial grace, and beautiful with all the soul's expansion, shall we behold her face, and though at times impetuous with emotion and anguish long suppressed, the swelling heart heaves moaning like the ocean that cannot be at rest. We will be patient and assuage the feeling we may not wholly stay. By silence sanctifying, not concealing, the grief that must have way. End of poem. This recording is in a public domain. Christus Consolator by Rosita Worthington Raymond From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3 Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Christus Consolator Beside the dead I knelt for prayer, and felt a presence as I prayed. Lo, it was Jesus standing there. He smiled. Be not afraid. Lord, thou hast conquered death, we know. Restore again to life, I said, this one who died an hour ago. He smiled. She is not dead. Asleep then, as thyself did say, yet thou canst lift the lids that keep her prisoned eyes from ours away he smiled she doth not sleep nay then though haply she do wake and look upon some fairer dawn restore her to our hearts that ache he smiled she is not gone alas too well we know our loss nor hope again our joy to touch until the stream of death we cross he smiled there is no such Yet our beloved seem so far, the while we yearn to feel them near, albeit with thee we trust they are. He smiled, and I am here. Dear Lord, how shall we know that they still walk unseen with us and thee, nor sleep nor wander far away? He smiled, abide in me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Comfort by Elizabeth Barrett Browning From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Comfort Speak low to me, my Saviour, low and sweet From out the hallelujahs, sweet and low Lest I should fear and fall and miss thee so Who art not missed by any that entreat Speak to me as Mary at thy feet, and if no precious gums my hands bestow, let my tears drop like amber while I go, in reach of thy divinest voice complete, in humanest affection, thus in sooth, to lose the sense of losing, as a child who sombered seeks the woods forevermore, is son to instead by mother's mouth, till, sinking on her breast, Love reconciled, he sleeps the faster than he wept before. End of poem. This recording is in a public domain. The Secret of Death by Sir Edwin Arnold From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3 Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Secret of Death she is dead, they said to him. Come away, kiss her and leave her. Thy love is clay. They smoothed her tresses of dark brown hair. On her forehead of stone they laid it fair. 
Over her eyes that gazed too much, they drew the lids with a gentle touch. With a tender touch they closed up well the sweet thin lips that had secrets to tell. About her brows and beautiful face they tied her veil and her marriage lace, and drew on her white feet her white silk shoes, which were the whitest no eye could choose. And over her bosom they crossed her hands, Come away, they said, God understands. And there was silence, and nothing there but silence, and scents of Eglantere. And jasmine, and roses, and rosemary, and they said, As a lady should lie, lies she. And they held their breath till they left the room, with a shudder, to glance at its stillness and gloom. But he who loved her too well to dread the sweet, the stately, the beautiful dead, he lit his lamp and took the key, and turned it, alone again, he and she. He and she, but she would not speak, though he kissed in the old place the quiet cheek. He and she, yet she would not smile, though he called her the name she loved erewhile. He and she, still she did not move to any one passionate whisper of love. Then he said, cold lips and breasts without breath, is there no voice, no language of death? Dumb to the ear and still to the sense, but to heart and to soul distinct, intense. See now, I will listen with soul, not ear. What was the secret of dying, dear? Was it the infinite wonder of all that you ever could let life's flower fall? Or was it a greater marvel to feel the perfect calm over the agony steal? Was the miracle greater to find how deep Beyond all dreams sank downward that sleep? Did life roll back its records, dear, And show, as they say it does, past things clear? And was it the innermost heart of the bliss To find out, so, what a wisdom love is? O oh, perfect dead, O oh, dead most dear, I hold the breath of my soul to hear. I listen as deep as to horrible hell, as high as to heaven, and you do not tell. There must be pleasure in dying, sweet, to make you so placid from head to feet. I would tell you, darling, if I were dead, and were your hot tears upon my brow shed. I would say, though the angel of death had laid his sword on my lips to keep it unsaid. You should not ask vainly with streaming eyes, which of all deaths was the chiefest surprise? The very strangest and suddenest thing of all the surprises that dying must bring. Ah, foolish world, O oh, most kind dead, though he told me, who will believe it was said? Who will believe that he heard her say with a sweet, soft voice in the dear old way? The utmost wonder is this I hear and see you and love you and kiss you, dear. And am your angel who was your bride, And know that, though dead, I have never died. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Peace by Anonymous From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Peace there is the peace that cometh after sorrow, Of hope surrendered, not of hope fulfilled, A peace that looketh not upon tomorrow, But calmly on a tempest that is stilled, A peace which lives not now in joy's excesses, Nor in the happy life of love secure, But in the unerring strength of the heart possesses Of conflicts won while learning to endure. A peace there is, in sacrifice secluded, A life subdued, from will and passion free. Tis not the peace that over Eden brooded, But that which triumphed in Gethsemane. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Footsteps of Angels by Henry Wordsworth Longfellow 
from the world's best poetry volume three sorrow and consolation part two read for librivox dot org by gabby footsteps of angels when the hours of day are numbered and the voices of the night wake the better soul that slumbered to a holy calm delight ere the evening lamps are lighted and like phantoms grim and tall shadows from the fitful firelight dance upon the parlor wall then the forms of the departed enter at the open door the beloved ones the true-hearted come to visit me once more he the young and strong who cherished noble longings for the strife by the roadside fell and perished weary with the march of life they the holy ones and weakly who the cross of suffering bore folded their pale hands so meekly spake with us on earth no more and with them the being beauteous who unto my youth was given more than all things else to love me and is now a saint in heaven with a slow and noiseless footstep comes that messenger divine takes the vacant chair beside me lays her gentle hand in mine and she sits and gazes at me with those deep and tender eyes like the stars so still and sane like looking downward from the skies uttered not yet comprehended is the spirit's voiceless prayer soft rebukes in blessings ended breathing from her lips of air oh though oft depressed and lonely all my fears are laid aside if i but remember only such as these have lived and died end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Happy are the dead by Henry Vaughan from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Happy are the dead. I walked the other day to spend my hour into a field where I sometimes had seen the soil to yield a gallant flower. But winter now had ruffled all the bower and curious store I knew there heretofore. Yet I, whose search loved not to peep and peer in the face of things, thought with myself there might be other springs beside this here, which, like cold friends, sees us but once a year, and so the flower might have some other bower. Then taking up what I could nearest spy, I digged about that place where I had seen him to grow out, and by and by I saw the warm recluse alone to lie, where fresh and green he lived, of us unseen. Many a question intricate and rare did I dare strow, but all I could extort was that he now did dare repair such losses as befell him in this air, and would ere long come forth most fair and young. This past I threw the clothes quite over his head, and stung with fear of my own frailty, dropped down many a tear upon his bed. Then sighing, whispered, Happy are the dead, what peace doth now rock him asleep below? And yet how few believe such doctrine springs from a poor root, which all the winter sleeps here underfoot, and hath no wings to raise it to the truth and light of things but is still trod by every wandering clod. O thou whose spirit did at first inflame and warm the dead, and by a sacred incubation fed with life this frame 
which once had neither being form nor name grant i may so thy steps track here below that in these masks and shadows i may see thy sacred way and by those hid ascents climb to that day which breaks from thee who art in all things though invisibly show me thy peace thy mercy love and ease and from this care where dreams and sorrows reign lead me above where light joy leisure and true comforts move without all pain there hid in thee show me his life again at whose dumb urn thus all the year i mourn End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Green Grass Under the Snow by Annie A. Preston From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3 Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Green Grass Under the Snow The work of the sun is slow, but as sure as heaven we know so we'll not forget when the skies are wet there's green grass under the snow when the winds of winter blow wailing like voices of woe there are april showers and buds and flowers and green grass under the snow we find that it's ever so in this life's uneven flow we've only to wait in the face of fate for the green grass under the snow End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Conqueror's Grave by William Cullen Bryant From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Gabi The Conqueror's Grave Within this lowly grave a conqueror lies, And yet the monument proclaims it not, Nor round the sleeper's name hath chisel wrought The emblems of a fame that never dies, Ivy and amaranth in a graceful sheaf, Twined with the laurel's fair imperial leaf a simple name alone to the great world unknown is graven here and wild flowers rising round meek meadow sweet and violets of the ground lean lovingly against the humble stone here in the quiet earth they laid apart no man of iron mould and bloody hands who sought to wreck upon the cowering lands the passions that consumed his restless heart but one of tender spirit and delicate frame gentlest in mien and mind of gentle womankind timidly shrinking from the breath of blame one in whose eyes the smile of kindness made its haunt like flowers by sunny brooks in may yet at the thought of others pain a shade of sweetest sadness chased the smile away nor deem that when the hand that moulders here was raised in menace realms were chilled with fear and armies mustered at the sign as when clouds rise on clouds before the rainy east gray captains leading bands of veteran men and fiery youths to be the vultures feast not thus were raged the mighty wars that gave the victory to her who fills this grave alone her task was wrought alone the battle fought through that long strife her constant hope was stayed on god alone nor looked for other aid she met the hosts of sorrow with a look that altered not beneath the frown they wore and soon the lowering brood were tamed and took meekly her gentle rue and frown no more 
her soft hand put aside the assaults of wrath and calmly broke in twain the fiery shafts of pain and rent the nets of passion from her path by that victorious hand despair was slain with love she vanquished hate and overcame evil with good in her great master's name her glory is not of this shadowy state glory that with the fleeting season dies but when she entered at the sapphire gate what joy was radiant in celestial eyes how heaven's bright depths with sounding welcomes rung and flowers of heaven by shining hands were flung and he who long before pain scorn and sorrow bore the mighty sufferer with aspect sweet smiled on the timid stranger from his seat he who returning glorious from the grave dragged death disarmed in chains a crouching slave see as i linger here the sun grows low cool airs are murmuring that the night is near o gentle sleeper from thy grave i go consoled though sad in hope and yet in fear brief is the time i know the warfare scarce begun yet all may win the triumphs thou hast won still flows the fount whose waters strengthened thee the victors names are yet too few to fill heaven's mighty roll the glorious armory that ministered to thee is open still end of poem this recording is in the public domain Lord Gone to the Grave by Reginald Heber from the world's best poetry volume three sorrow and consolation part two read for LibriVox.org by liam thou art gone to the grave thou art gone to the grave but we will not deplore thee though sorrows and darkness encompass the tomb the saviour has passed through its portals before thee and the lamp of his love is thy guide through the gloom thou art gone to the grave we no longer behold thee nor tread the rough path of the world by thy side but the wide arms of mercy are spread to enfold thee and sinners may hope since the sinless has died thou art gone to the grave and its mansion forsaking perhaps thy tried spirit in doubt lingered long but the sunshine of heaven beamed bright on thy waking and the song which thou heardst was seraphim's song thou art gone to the grave but it were wrong to deplore thee when god was thy ransom thy guardian thy guide he gave thee and took thee and soon will restore thee where death hath no sting since the saviour hath died end of poem this recording is in the public domain lycidas by john milton from the world's best poetry volume three sorrow and consolation part two read for librivox dot org by thomas peter lycidas yet once more o oh, ye laurels and once more ye myrtles brown with ivy never sear i come to pluck your berries harsh and crude and with forced fingers rude shatter your leaves before the mellowing year Bitter constraint and sad occasion dear Compels me to disturb your season due. For Lycidas is dead, dead ere his prime, Young Lycidas, and hath not left his peer. Who would not sing for Lycidas? He knew himself to sing, and build the lofty rhyme. He must not float upon his watery beer unwept, And welter to the parching wind Without the meed of some melodious tear. 
Begin then, sisters of the sacred well, That from beneath the seat of Jove doth spring. Begin, and somewhat loudly sweep the string. Hence with denial vain, and coy excuse, So may some gentle muse with lucky words Favour my destined urn, and as he passes turn, And bid fair peace be to my sable shroud, for we were nursed upon the self-same hill, Fed the same flock by fountain, shade, and rill, Together both, ere the high lawns appeared Under the opening eyelids of the morn. We drove afield, and both together heard What time the grey fly winds her sultry horn, Battening our flocks with the fresh dews of night, Off till the star that rose at evening bright Toward heaven's descent had sloped his westering wheel. Meanwhile the rural ditties were not mute, Tempered to the oaten flute. Rough satyrs danced, and fawns with cloven heel From the glad song would not be absent long, And old Demetus loved to hear our song. But, oh, the heavy change, now thou art gone, Now thou art gone, and never must return. Thee, shepherd, Thee the woods and desert caves, With wild thyme and the gadding vine o'ergrown, And all their echoes, mourn. The willows and the hazel copses green Shall now no more be seen, Fanning their joyous leaves to thy soft lays. As killing as the canker to the rose, Or taint-worm to the weanling herds that graze, Or frost to flowers that their gay wardrobe wear, when first the white thorn blows, such, Lycidas, thy loss to shepherd's ear. Where were ye, nymphs, when the remorseless deep closed o'er the head of your loved Lycidas? For neither were ye playing on the steep, where your old bards, the famous druids, lie, nor on the shaggy top of Mona high, nor yet where Diva spreads her wizard stream. Ay me, I fondly dream. Had ye been there, for what could that have done? What could the muse herself that Orpheus bore, The muse herself for her enchanting son, Whom universal nature did lament, When, by the rout that made the hideous roar, His gory visage down the stream was sent, Down the swift Hebrus to the lesbian shore? Alas, what boots it with incessant care To tend the homely, slighted shepherd's trade, And strictly meditate the thankless muse? Were it not better done, as others use, To sport with Amaryllis in the shade, Or with the tangles of Neaera's hair? Fame is the spur that the clear spirit doth raise, That last infirmity of noble minds, To scorn delights, and live laborious days. But the fair guerdon when we hope to find, And think to burst out into sudden blaze, Comes the blind fury with the abhorred shears, And slits the thin-spun life. But not the praise, Phoebus replied, And touched my trembling ears. Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil, Nor in the glistering foil set off to the world, Nor in broad rumour lies, But lives and spreads aloft by those pure eyes, and perfect witness of all judging Jove, as he pronounces lastly on each deed, of so much fame in heaven expect thy meed. O fountain Arethus, and thou honoured flood, smooth sliding Mincius, crowned with vocal reeds, that strain I heard was of a higher mood. But now my oat proceeds, and listens to the herald of the sea that came in Neptune's plea. He asked the waves, and asked the felon winds, What hard mishap hath doomed this gentle swain? And questioned every gust of rugged winds That blows from off each beaked promontory, They knew not of his story. And sage Hippotides their answer brings, That not a blast was from his dungeon strayed. The air was calm, and on the level brine, Sleek Panope with all her sisters played. It was that fateful and perfidious bark, Built in the eclipse, and rigged with curses dark, That sunk so low that sacred head of thine. Next Camus, reverend sire, went footing slow, His mantle hairy, and his bonnet sedge, And wrought with figures dim, and on the edge, Like to that sanguine flower, inscribed with woe. 
Ah, who hath reft, quoth he, my dearest pledge? Last came, and last did go, the pilot of the Galilean lake. Two massy keys he bore of metals twain, the golden opes, the iron shuts amain. He shook his mitred locks, and stern bespake. How well could I have spared for thee, young swain, enough of such as for their bellies' sake, creep and intrude and climb into the fold. Of other care they little reckoning make than how to scramble at the shearer's feast and shove away the worthy bidden guest, blind mouse, that scarce themselves know how to hold a sheep hook, or have learned aught else the least that to the faithful herdsman's art belongs. What wrecks it them? What need they? They are sped. And when they list, their lean and flashy songs grate on their scrannel pipes of wretched straw. The hungry sheep look up, and are not fed, but, swollen with wind and the rank mist they draw, wrought inwardly, and foul contagion spread. Besides, what the grim wolf with privy paw daily devours apace, and nothing said, but that two-handed engine at the door stands ready to smite once and smite no more return alpheus the dread voice is past that shrunk thy streams return sicilian muse and call the veils and bid them hither cast their bells and flowerets of a thousand hues ye valleys low where the mild whispers use of shades and wanton winds and gushing brooks on whose fresh lap the swart star sparely looks throw hither all your quaint enamelled eyes that on the green turf suck the honeyed showers and purple all the ground with vernal flowers bring the wraith primrose at forsaken dyes the tufted croto and pale gethsemane the white pink and the pansy freaked with jet the glowing violet the musk rose and the well-attired woodbine with cowslips wan that hang the pensive head and every flower that sad embroidery wears bid amaranthus all his beauty shed and daffodillies fill their cups with tears to strew the laureate hearse where lycid lies for so to interpose a little ease let our frail thoughts dally with false surmise ay me whilst thee the shores and sounding seas wash far away where'er thy bones are hurled whether beyond the stormy hebrides where thou perhaps under the whelming tide visits the bottom of the monstrous world or whether thou to our moist vows denied sleepst by the fable of bellerus old where the great vision of the guarded mount looks towards the mancus and Bayonus hold look homeward angel now and melt with ruth and o oh, ye dolphins waft the hapless youth weep no more woeful shepherds weep no more for lycidas your sorrow is not dead sunk though he be beneath the watery floor so sinks the day-star in the ocean bed and yet anon repairs his drooping head and tricks his beams and with new spangled oar flames in the forehead of the morning sky so lycidas sunk low but mounted high through the dear might of him that walked the waves where other groves and other streams along with nectar pure his oozy locks he laves and hears the unexpressive nuptial song in the blessed kingdoms meek of joy and love there entertain him all the saints above in solemn troops and sweet societies that sing and singing in their glory move and wipe the tears forever from his eyes now lycidas the shepherds weep no more henceforth thou art the genius of the shore in thy large recompense and shalt be good to all that wander in that perilous flood thus sang the uncouth swain to the oaks and rills while the still morn went out with sandals grey he touched the tender stops of various quills with eager thought warbling his doric lay and now the sun had stretched out all the hills and now was dropped into the western bay at last he rose and twitched his mantle blue to-morrow to fresh woods and pastures new 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. After Death From Pearls of the Faith by Sir Edwin Arnold From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3 Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter After Death From Pearls of the Faith He made life, and he takes it but instead gives more. Praise the restore, al muhid He who dies at Azan sends this to comfort faithful friends. Faithful friends! It lies, I know, pale and white and cold as snow, and he says, Abdullah's dead, weeping at my feet and head. I can see your falling tears, I can hear your cries and prayers, yet I smile and whisper this, I am not that thing you kiss. Cease your tears and let it lie. It was mine, it is not I. Sweet friends, watch the women lave for its last bed in the grave is a tent which I am quitting, is a garment no more fitting, is a cage from which at last, like a hawk, my soul hath passed. Love the inmate, not the room, the wearer, not the garb, the plume of the falcon, not the bars which kept him from the splendid stars. Loving friends, be wise and dry straight away every weeping eye. What she lift upon the bier is not worth a wistful tear. Tis an empty seashell, one out of which the pearl is gone. The shell is broken, it lies there. The pearl, the all, the soul is here. Tis an earthen jar whose lid Allah sealed, the while it hid that treasure of his treasury. A mind which loved him, let it lie, let the shard be earth's once more, since the gold shines in his store. Allah Muhid, Allah most good, now thy grace is understood. Now my heart no longer wonders what al Barsak is, which sunders life from death, and death from heaven nor the paradises seven, which the happy dead inherit, nor those birds which bear each spirit toward the throne, green birds and white, radiant, glorious, swift their flight. Now the long, long darkness ends, yet ye wail, my foolish friends, while the man whom ye call dead in unbroken bliss instead lives, and loves you, lost, tis true, by any light which shines for you, but in light ye cannot see, of unfulfilled felicity, and enlarging paradise, lives the life that never dies. Farewell, friends, yet not farewell, where I am ye too shall dwell. I am gone before your face, a heart beats time, a grey ant's pace. When ye come where I have stepped, ye will marvel why ye wept. Ye will know, by true love taught, that here is all and there is not. Weep a while, if ye are fain, sunshine still must follow rain. Only not at death, for death, now I see, is that first breath which our souls draw when we enter life, that is of all life center. Know ye Allah's law is love, viewed from Allah's throne above. Be ye firm of trust, and come faithful onward to your home. La Allah illya Allah, Yea, Muhid, restore, sovereign, say. He who died at Hassan gave this to those that made his grave. Azan is the hour of prayer, esteemed a blessed time to die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. It is not death to die by George Washington Bethune from the world's best poetry volume 3 sorrow and consolation part 2 read for librivox.org by gabi it is not death to die it is not death to die to leave this weary road and midst the brotherhood on high to be at home with God. It is not death to close the eye long dimmed by tears and wake in glorious repose to spend eternal years. 
it is not death to bear the wrench that sets us free from dungeon chain to breathe the air of boundless liberty it is not death to fling aside this sinful dust and rise on strong exulting wing to live among the just jesus thou prince of life thy chosen cannot die like thee they conquer in the strife to reign with thee on high end of poem this recording is in the public domain there is no death by james l mccreary from the world's best poetry volume three Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Gabi There is no death There is no death The stars go down To rise upon some other shore And bright in heaven's jeweled crown They shine forevermore There is no death the forest leaves convert to life the viewless air the rocks disorganized to feed the hungry moss they bear there is no death the dust we tread shall change beneath the summer showers to golden grain or mellow fruit or rainbow tinted flowers there is no death the leaves may fall, the flowers may fade and pass away. They only wait through wintry hours the warm sweet breath of May. There is no death, the choicest gifts that heaven hath kindly lent to earth are ever first to seek again the country of their birth. And all things that for growth of joy are worthy of our love or care, whose loss has left us desolate, are safely garnered there. Though life become a dreary waste, we know its fairest, sweetest flowers, transplanted into paradise, adorn immortal bowers. The voice of bird-like melody that we have missed and mourned so long now mingles with the angel choir in everlasting song. There is no death, although we grieve when beautiful familiar forms that we have learned to love are torn from our embracing arms. Although with bowed and breaking heart with sable garb and silent tread we bear their senseless dust to rest and say that they are dead they are not dead they have but passed beyond the mists that blind us here into the new and larger life of that serene sphere they have but dropped their robe of clay to put their shining raiment on they have not wandered far away they are not lost or gone though disenthralled and glorified they still are here and love us yet the dear ones they have left behind they never can forget and sometimes when our hearts grow faint amid temptations fierce and deep or when the wildly raging waves of grief or passion sweep we feel upon our fevered brow their gentle touch their breath of balm their arms enfold us and our hearts grow comforted and calm and ever near us though unseen the dear immortal spirits tread for all the boundless universe is life there are no dead
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Going and Coming by Edward A. Jenks from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Going and Coming Going, the great round sun, dragging the captive day over behind the frowning hill, over beyond the bay, dying. Coming, the dusky night, silently stealing in, wrapping himself in the soft warm couch, where the golden-haired day hath been lying. Going, the bright blithe spring, blossoms, how fast ye fall, shooting out of your starry sky into the darkness all, blindly. Coming, the mellow days, crimson and yellow leaves, languishing purple and amber fruits, kissing the bearded sheaves, kindly. Going, our early friends, voices we loved are dumb, Footsteps grow dim in the morning dew, fainter the echoes come, ringing. Coming to join our march, shoulder to shoulder pressed, gray-haired veterans strike their tents for the far-off purple west, singing. Going, this old, old life, beautiful world, farewell, forest and meadow, river and hill, ring your loving knell over us. Coming, a nobler life, coming, a better land, coming, a long, long nightless day, coming, the grand, grand chorus. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Blind by Israel Zangwill from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Gabi Blind Laughing, the blind boys run around their college lawn, Playing such games of buff over its dappled grass. See the blind frolicsome girls in blue pinafores Turning their skipping robes. How full and rich a world theirs to inhabit is sweet scent of grass and bloom playmates glad symphony cool touch of western wind sunshine's divine caress how should they know or feel they are in darkness but oh the miracle if a redeemer came laid fingers on their eyes one touch, and what a world, new-born in loveliness. Spaces of green and sky, hulls of white cloud adrift, ivy-grown college walls, shining loved faces. What a dark world, who knows, ours to inhabit is. One touch, and what a strange, glory might burst on us what a hid universe do we sport carelessly blindly upon the verge of an apocalypse end of poem this recording is in the public domain the death of death sonnet 146 by william shakespeare from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 3, Sorrow and Consolation, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Death of Death, Sonnet 146 Poor soul, the center of my sinful earth, fooled by those rebel powers that thee array, why dost thou pine within and suffer dearth, painting thy outward walls so costly gay? Why so large cost? Having so short a lease, dost thou upon thy fading mansion spend? Shall worms, inheritors of this excess, eat up thy charge? Is this thy body's end? Then, soul, live thou upon thy servant's loss, and let that pine to aggravate thy store. By terms divine, in selling hours of dross, within be fed, without be rich no more. 
so shalt thou feed on death that feeds on man and death once dead there's no more dying then end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of the world's best poetry volume 3 sorrow and consolation part 2